tonight we're in for a real treat. <laughs> and our sponsor is Anonymous. Thank you, Anonymous. Okay. Um, and what a better way to start a Halloween month than with our dear Greg Williams. Greg was a district judge for 15 years, the last 10, as the first justice of the Edgartown District Court. He retired in 2015 and currently is the president of the Board of Trustees for Sturgis Library. Greg holds the distinction of being the only person to speak twice during a single season, four, time, four years in a row. So that, that's pretty darn good. So, without further ado, <laughs> without further ado, my good friend, the judge, Greg Williams. A couple of things before I start. Uh, I too wanted to thank Anonymous. I've always loved your poems. <laughs> songs and pithy sayings. Uh, I woke up this morning with a bad cold. <laughs> and I decided to treat it by uh, mixing Dayquil and night, uh, night, uh, night Quill to come up with Evening Quill. <laughs> so if this thing goes south, faster and farther than usual, that's the reason. Uh, oh, I got to find my, oh, here it is. You know how good I am with the AVs. In June 1902, a woman known as Jolly Jane Toppin, who you might have heard of, uh, went on trial in Barnstable Superior Court a half a mile down the road here the courthouse after this building was the courthouse. She had allegedly poisoned her friend, Minnie Davis Gibbs. <coughs> Trial lasted only one day. The verdict was a foregone conclusion. The judge instructed the jury to find Jane Toppin not guilty by reason of insanity, following which verdict she would be sent to the Taunton insane asylum, asylum for the rest of her life. When that verdict was announced, Jane laughed. And the following morning, she boarded the train here in the Barstable Village train station, where well, that was still a going concern. And uh, though she'd been tried for only one murder, the murder of Minnie Davis Gibbs, it was already uh, suspect, she was already suspected of having murdered many more people than that. So she was a global story, and there were a lot of reporters around, and they approached her as she got on the train, and she confidently told them that she would be released from Taunton in only a few years, just like Freeman. And they knew exactly what she meant. About 90 years earlier, a Baptist preacher from Pittsfield named William Miller had become fixated on the Bible verse in David chapter 8, verse eight, uh, 14, which reads, I'm sure you're familiar with this, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. To Miller, the message was clear. The cleansing of the sanctuary meant that Jesus Christ would return to earth and purify it. And to Miller, it was also clear that 2,300 days meant 2,300 years. And to calculate when the second coming of Jesus would occur, Miller figured that the starting date was 457 B.C., or as we semi-professional historians call it, BCE. 
That was the year, as you know, that Artaxerxes of Persia declared the rebuilding of Jerusalem. So applying simple math, Miller concluded that Christ would return at the latest in 1843. For planning purposes, Miller's followers, who were called Millerites, wanted to know the exact day that Jesus would return. And Miller eventually provided a time frame. He said that Jesus would be returning between March 21st, 1843, and March 21st, 1844. March 21st, 1844 came and went with no evidence of widespread purification. So uh, a new date was picked, and that was April 18th, 1844. Nothing. And then it was decided that the date should really be October 22nd, 1844. <laughs> October 23rd, 1844, and thereafter became known in capital letters as the Great Disappointment. <laughs> the number of Millerites decreased, but many remained believers in the relatively imminent return of Jesus. Now, of course, religious beliefs uh, fragment, they fall along a spectrum, but at the radical end was a group called the Second Adventists. The New York Times, in an article in May 1879, noted as follows, but before I do that, this art, I found this article online, and I don't know if this was the picture that they uh, printed in the New York Times when the article originally appeared, or whether the, the internet did this, but I gotta show it. <laughs> it's Rasputin who has absolutely nothing to do with this. <laughs> but the Times noted, and I quote, New York Times now, you've probably heard of that, the ultra views of Second Adventism have sprung up in the more par sparsely settled parts of Massachusetts at various times during the last 30 years. Members of this sect, quote, believed not only in the personal coming of Christ, but quite firmly in the continuance of revelations, signs, and miracles. The core belief then is that Jesus will return. The Adventists will be tipped off by signs when the second coming is about to occur, and when the second coming did occur, they would be in good shape. These beliefs had led followers, New York Times again, to many acts of fanaticism unquote, and many citizens regarded them as, quote, crazy, unquote. Other sources claimed that Second Adventists embraced the free love doctrine. Uh, we're not going to get into the difference, if any, between religious fervor and mental illness. <laughs> now, one of those more sparsely settled parts of Massachusetts was Pocasset. Anybody here from Pocasset or live in Pocasset? Anybody ever been to Pocasset? <laughs> Anybody ever heard of Pocasset? It's fantastic, it really is. It's just beautiful. Pocasset was in Sandwich before Bourne was incorporated in 1884. Bourne was the last town incorporated on the Cape. Uh, Pocasset is north of Catawmet, which was once called South Pocasset. And trying to discern the difference between these areas can be, can be uh, frustrating and challenging. But anyway, uh, not content with swiping at Second Adventists with words like fanatic and crazy, the Times in a separate editorial noted the following. This is a great quote. It goes on for a little while. The inhabitants of southeastern Massachusetts and Cape Cod are a class by themselves unlike any other citizens of the Commonwealth. <laughs> Dwelling in a hard, unfertile, unblessed corner of creation, <laughs> half sand, half marsh, swept in winter by bitterly cold winds and yielding little green on verdure under a summer sun, these people have all the tough and wiry qualities of the Yankee, 
without his genial and gen generous side. <laughs> their religion takes its color from their gloomy surroundings, and faiths that broaden elsewhere contract there until all heart and tolerance and human sympathy are squeezed out of them. <laughs> Freeman and his deluded company are specimens of the inhabitants of Cape Cod. <laughs> the Freeman referred to was Charles F. Freeman. Not, this is Rasputin. Freeman was born in Vermont, raised in Natick. As a teenager, he had joined the Union Army in the Civil War. After the war, he was a shoemaker in Lynn. He married Harriet Ellis. I was hoping Joan would be here, but I guess she's not. Okay. Uh, Harriet Ellis was from Plymouth. They had a daughter, Lillian, who died in infancy. Uh, they then moved to Pocasset, population then just south of 400 people or so. And uh, in 1891, they moved there to try their hand farming in the sandy slash marshy soil. They lived in an area called Putts Hollow, which is near the present day Pocasset Golf Course. Get it? Putts Hollow. <laughs> Uh, their house was about a half a mile from the nearest residence, about a half a mile from the Pocasset train station. Besides farming, uh, Freeman would collect the mail in the morning uh, from the train station and deliver it to the village post office, a job that many believe he got because he was a veteran. Uh, in Pocasset, the Freemans had two daughters, Bessie, born in 1872, and Edith, born in 1874. Now, as we all know, parents are not supposed to favor one child over another. Freeman did. His favorite was Edith, Edie, whom he called his pet, his idol. Freeman had become a Methodist uh, about the age of 21 when he lived in Natick. But during the winter of 1877-1878, an itinerant preacher uh, known only as Elder Brown in, ignited in Pocasset what became known as the Pocasset Revival. Now, Methodism itself had been suspect in Congregationalist-dominated uh, New England earlier in the century uh, because of its emotional services carried on in those tent meetings out in the woods. Uh, such religious services provided rural people uh, chances for socializing, feeling a little bit of excitement, uh, getting emotional. But this revival, this arrival of Second Adventism, took religious enthusiasm to a whole different level. So a faction of Methodist-led, uh, a, a faction from the Methodist-led Union Evangelical Church in Pocasset seceded from that church and they became second Adventists. And one was the man who had taken care of the church building, had taught Sunday school, and had rung the church bell, Charles Freeman. And once Elder Brown moved on, Freeman, he's about 32, 33 years old at this point, probably 32, he quickly exploited his talent for delivering fiery sermons, and he became the leader of the Second Adventists in Picasso. He became consumed by that religion. He became consumed by his role in that religion. And to, as far as Hattie was concerned, as she later told it, uh, Freeman really snapped in April of 1879 when, Hat I said Hattie, her, her name was Harry, and I should have told you she was usually called Hattie. Um, Hattie's brother-in-law, returned home from the sea, and he became so enraged that Freeman had converted his wife, Hattie's sister, to Adventism that he threatened to shoot Freeman. And uh, that apparently, as far as Hattie was concerned, really, uh, really twisted him in a, in a different direction. 
it had indeed troubled him greatly. Uh, the visions he had experienced for a while increased in intensity. A Freeman had been preaching for a while of impending sacrifice, necessary, in his words, to rudely awaken the world from its present condition. So in mid-April 1879, the general notion of sacrifice was swirling around this Adventist community. Uh, and then Freeman got more specific. Freeman heard the unequivocal commands of God. He must sacrifice a member of his family. Uh, Freeman and Hattie, both 33 years old at this point, discussed what had to happen. And the upshot was that Freeman ordered Hattie not to stand in the Lord's way. Freeman prayed that he himself would be the sacrifice. Uh, but at the same time, he had become obsessed with the story of Abraham and Isaac, chronicled in Genesis chapter 22. These, I've got two paintings here of, of, of Abraham and Isaac. Uh, this one, they're both supposed to be by Michelangelo Morisi da Caravaggio. Not Michelangelo or Michelangelo, but Caravaggio. Although this one might be from somebody in his studio. The face on the angel just isn't doing it, I don't think. It's a little... That doesn't look right to me. That doesn't even look like a guy, much less an angel. And I think this one is a better painting. And that's Caravaggio because somebody's screaming. He's going to put that in every painting if he gets half a chance. And he got one here. So you know this story. You know the story of Abraham and Isaac. Simplified version. Uh, God tells Abraham to take his only son, Isaac, and make of him a burnt offering. That is going to entail stabbing Isaac to death. So Abraham takes Isaac up the mountain, binds him, takes up the knife, and then, right at the last moment, angel of the Lord, who's pointing here, calls on him and says, don't do it. I got a ram right here. You're all set. <laughs> Stops it. Now, Hebrew scholars who interpret this story argue uh, several interpretations. One is that neither Abraham nor God intended the actual sacrifice of Isaac. Uh, the command had been that Isaac be raised up as an offering. And God was using the incident to teach that human sacrifice was wrong. Other Hebrew scholars uh, suggest that rather than God testing Abraham, Abraham was actually testing God. By appearing to obey God's command, Abraham was pressuring God into demonstrating the morality of preserving human life. Freeman did not analyze the language of Genesis in such a fashion. To him, the story was plain. God commanded Abraham to kill his son, and that is what Abraham was going to do. As it happened, God, in the form of the angel, stopped him. On the night of April 30th, 1879, Freeman had not eaten for several days. Uh, that night, he and Hattie saw lightning, which they considered supernatural. And in the early morning, 2, 2.30 in the morning of May 1st, 1879, Freeman bolted awake. It was time for the sacrifice. The dream that he had just had told him precisely what to do. The sacrifice was not going to be Freeman himself. The sacrifice must be his younger daughter, his favorite, his pet, his idol, Edith Burgess Freeman, born July 27, 1874. She was four years old. Freeman woke Hattie up, told her the substance of his dream. Now, she had accepted this whole sacrifice notion in the abstract, 
but now it was becoming real and she begged Freeman not to do it. And he argued back to her, in essence, one, don't worry about it. Uh, just as with Abraham, God is going to relent at the last moment. Or two, even if he does not do that, and I end up killing Edie, she'll be resurrected in three days. <laughs> Made perfect sense to Hattie, and she relented. Freeman prayed, kneeling by his bed and walking out to his shed to re retrieve his knife. And he kept praying over and over that he would not have to do it. You notice that Freeman's facial hair changes in every picture. There, there's, there's, there's not really a reliable picture that I'm aware of or have been able to find of what he actually looked like. Uh, the girls slept in the same bed, that is Edie and Bessie. In their room, Hattie lit a lantern and then carried the sleeping Bessie out of her room to her parents' room. And then Freeman pulled the coverlet down from Edie and raised her left, left arm. And then he raised the knife that he had just retrieved from the shed, still praying that he would be stopped. He was not. The knife entered Edie between her fifth and sixth ribs, penetrating her heart. And she opened her eyes and looked at him and said, Oh, Papa. He picked her up and held her for the very brief time between that and her death. And then he laid her back on her bed, lay down beside her, praying until he fell asleep. And the following morning, he got up and performed his mail duties. And then he ran into a fellow Adventist, and he asked him to spread the word that there would be a 3 o'clock meeting uh, that afternoon at his, that is, Freeman's house. And around that time, about two dozen of the believers uh, arrived and found the Freemans in an unusually gentle and happy mood. They gathered in Freeman's dining room, as they had before. Uh, these people all met in houses. They didn't have an actual church building. And Freeman announced right off the bat that there wouldn't be any singing this time around. And then he preached at least a half an hour, mostly on the theme of sacrifice. Then finally he said something along the lines of, ours is a religion of sacrifice, and God has called for one more offering. It is for Edie. Come. And he then led them into the next room where Edie was lying on her bed. Uh, very little said, apparently. Uh, there was some uneasiness. There seemed to be some incipient protest, but the discomfort of all of these believers was short-lived, uh, partially perhaps because the sacrifice they'd been hearing about was not going to be their own. Uh, but also because Freeman convinced them that he had received a divine command and that divine command had been fulfilled. And in any event, on the third day hence, which was going to be Sunday, uh, Edie would be resurrected. And God would thereby demonstrate to everybody, Adventists, everybody, that the Adventists had been correct all along. They all left the Freeman house, and not one of them reported this murder to authorities. But as it happened, that very same evening, the village constable, a young gentleman named H. Seth Redding, called on 16-year-old Minnie Davis, who was an Adventist who had been at Freeman's uh, revelation that afternoon with her parents. And once those two were alone, she started to cry. And Redding asked her why, and she told him. 
Redding left, confirmed that event with another Adventist who had been there in the afternoon, then went on to, the, uh, to a selectman, and by the following afternoon, uh, the deputy sheriff was there, the medical examiner was there, and another doctor arrived at the Freeman's house to find a large crowd outside. Freeman's cordially welcomed them in. They found Edie lying on her left side in the bed with the knife wound about one and three quarters inches long, three inches deep between her ribs. The termination was made. She could not have lived more than two or three minutes. Uh, asked if he'd killed Edie, Freeman said yes, as ordered by the Lord, as Abraham was ordered to sacrifice his son Isaac. And if the Lord had not meant that I should kill her, he would have stayed my hand. Deputy arrested Freeman transported him by train uh, here to the Barnstable Village, where the new jail had just been built. Um, you all recognize this as the courthouse. Well, right behind it used to be that jail, burned down in 1935. It is very possible that the first occupants of the jail were the Freemans. At least they were among the first occupants there. Now on the train, Freeman's with the deputy, and there are about 40 or 50 other passengers in the train car. And Freeman's in good spirits. He's praying out loud. He's singing. And he finally gets on his knees on the bench to turn around to address them. And he told them exactly what he had done. And he told them that Edie would be resurrected. In jail, Freeman continued to foretell the coming miracle, plus his own glory. Uh, he would, in essence, become the new Abraham. The Freemans would remain incarcerated until the October sitting of the court. Remember, this occurred on the first day of May. And Hattie uh, started to lose it while she was incarcerated, appeared disconsolate. Uh, to people, but Freeman never did, never showed remorse, uh, never showed any emotion besides a kind of religious ecstasy. Now on the morning of the day that her father had expected her resurrection, uh, Sunday, May 4th, her funeral took place in the Catawba United Methodist Church, what now called the Catawba Methodist, uh, United Methodist Church, crowded to overflowing. More people outside, there were hundreds of people there. The Methodist pastor, whose name was the Reverend Edward Williams, no relation, uh, agreed to conduct the funeral. He was assisted by a Baptist minister. As long as no Adventist participated in the service. The funeral cortege down to the church had begun at the home of a gentleman called Alden P. Davis. Uh, it had been a Davis's daughter, Minnie, who had revealed the murder to the constable. In Freeman's absence, while he was incarcerated, Alden Davis became the leading spirit of the Adventists. So he led that cortege in Freeman's open buggy bearing Edie's coffin. Uh, behind his carriage was one uh, carrying seven-year-old Bessie her grandmother, and Freeman's brother from Natick. And behind them were four carriages of Adventists. At the church, Davis got down from the buggy and, refusing all assistance, uh, carried Edie's coffin into the church under his arm and marched down the aisle of the church and placed the coffin on a table right in front of the pulpit. And there was a plaque on the coffin lid which was surrounded by a wreath of mayflowers and evergreens, and the plaque read, Little Edie lived only 57 months. She, sh she, sh she shall surely rise again. John chapter 6, verse 39. Uh, she was wearing a white gown with a blue sash. She had blue ribbons in her hair. And some Adventists stretched to see her, uh, maybe to perceive any movement that might signal her coming alive again or her resurrection. 
After the opening hymn and then the sermon, the Reverend Williams announced that there would be a closing hymn and that would be the end of the service. Alden Davis got up, stood in front of Edie's coffin and said, to facilitate time while the friends are viewing the remains, I will make a few remarks as I, Williams interrupted him, we don't wish for any more remarks. And Davis, very uh, highly miffed, said, very well, then the remains will be viewed outside the church. Uh, he put the coffin lid back on Edie's coffin, carried it out to what was reported uh, in one newspaper at least as a small graveyard behind the church and then opened it again. And then Davis got up on a fallen gravestone and he launched into a speech, beginning with his personal story of having been an infidel until his religious awakening two years previous. Uh, and then he asked the crowd to recite with him the Lord's Prayer. Two or three hundred people there, maybe six people recited it with him, Adventists. And then growing more excited, Davis proclaimed, the world is standing aghast at the deed and its causes. I know some of those causes, but not all of them. No one knows better than I the motives of this afflicted man and his wife now in jail. Mr. Freeman's character, his Christian integrity has been questioned and he has been called a hypocrite. I declare in his defense that there never lived a better or pure man. At this point, there's a selectman there, he begged Davis to stop in the name of common decency and the friends of the family, but other people in the crowd started yelling things like, arrest him, uh, don't let him go on, and then there were cries of choke him and bury him in the open grave. Uh, Davis uh, replied to all of this that he would do as he pleased since the medical examiner had given him charge of Edie's body. He began shouting, I intend to defend the motives of my friend in committing this, and people started shouting, murder, murder. Crowd closed in on Davis. He clamored to be heard. Uh, the, uh, the Reverend Edward Williams implored Davis to stop, and Davis appealed to the crowd, I am asked to desist in defending the father of the child in the coffin before you. And then he called for a show of hands from those who wanted him to stop. Almost everyone raised his or her hand. Then he asked for the hands from those who wanted him to continue. And again, about a half a dozen people raised hands. Then Davis indicated that the meeting was dismissed. And then he said he had forgotten to announce that there would be a Grove camp meeting June 15th through the 30th, uh, to which he invited, quote, every, do, uh, every denomination to send their champion men to, and then several of the crowd finished his sentence with, to be murdered. And Freeman's brother finally said, do, for God's sake, stop, that we may bury the dead. He and Davis placed uh, Edie's coffin in the grave. The clergy read the uh, ritual and recited benediction. And then Davis, sho Davis himself shoveled the earth into the grave on top of the coffin, which was fairly shallow, the hole for the for the uh, coffin, and he threw the dirt in uh, loosely, which helped fuel fears that some of the Adventists would open the grave and demonstrate that Edie had indeed been translated to heaven. To forestall that possibility, a deputy kept watch over the grave site for several days. The thing about Edie's grave is that nobody knows where it is as far as I've been able to determine. Uh, one newspaper, as I indicated, reported that Davis had carried her to the graveyard behind the church. There is no cemetery back there. The church has been expanded quite a bit. Looks like a 1950s or so thing. Uh, and there's a parking lot back there. There are no graves, at least marked. Um, there is a cemetery directly across the street, the Katomet Cemetery, she is not recorded as being in there. 
There is another cemetery 1.6 miles down the road called the Pocasset Cemetery. She is not recorded as being in there. Uh, but the most powerful evidence, as far as I'm concerned, as to the mystery of where Edie is buried is the fact that people love to post photographs of graves on the internet. And hers is not there. Um, there's a website called Find a Grave, which I'm sure you all go on fairly often. Uh, I know I do. Not there. There's no indication I've been able to find as to where uh, this poor child was buried. Anyway, the summer went by. Grand jury convened in uh, October. The Freemans were bought, uh, brought before the Superior Court here in Barnstable late on a Friday afternoon. And the clerk advised Hattie that the grand jury had found no bill against her. She was discharged and immediately led from the courtroom. Freeman, though, had been indicted for murder in the first degree, right in the indictment, with a butcher knife. And he was scheduled to be arraigned before a special session of the Supreme Judicial Court which handled murder cases at the trial level uh, in the 19th century. In January 1880, the Supreme Judicial Court held a competency hearing. A single justice found Freeman incompetent to stand trial, and this time he was transferred from the Barnstable Jail to the Danvers Lunatic Hospital, which serves as the model for some of H.P. Lovecraft's buildings, if you're familiar with that writer. Uh, now, this puzzles me a little bit, and I haven't been able to find an explanation for this. Competency is different from legal insanity. Competency is a person's ability to understand the charges against them, uh, the character of the proceedings, the trial, and what various people in the trial do. And uh, also, one's ability to assist in one's own defense. How Freeman was incompetent is, uh, is hard to understand. I've not been able to nail down why. He, probably just because they wanted to keep him in custody in an insane asylum, is my guess. But uh, incompetent, who knows. Uh, five months later, there was another competency hearing. Found him incompetent again. Another trip to Danvers. Uh, finally, though, in April 1882, a uh, doctor found that Freeman's delusions had passed and he was well. Uh, indeed, he was by then, quote, a man of most excellent general character and unassuming in his religious views. Despite that opinion, Freeman held, was held for another year until on May 1st, 1883, which was the fourth anniversary of Edie's murder. He appeared before the Supreme Judicial Court on a sanity hearing. Again, sanity is different from competency. Insanity, which is a legal term, not a medical term, is, uh, and this is oversimplified, it's an inability to realize that one's behavior is wrong or an inability to conform one's behavior to what the law requires. Several physicians testified that Freeman was not insane any longer and had not been insane for about a year. Uh, Freeman himself testified at this hearing and he said and acknowledged that he had been insane four years previously but declared he was no longer. Before his commitment to Danvers, Freeman explained, he had never known anyone who was insane. But when he got to Danvers, <laughs> he found people who saw and spoke with God and or Jesus, who had revelations, saw signs, and Freeman understood that those men were insane. And since they were insane, Freeman began wondering whether he was too. And he concluded that he was. Uh, 
or at least had been. But now, 1883, he considered Edie's murder the most dreadful act that was ever perpetrated. And asked if he was remorseful, he said uh, that he was in error. Uh, he, quote, had grief and sorrow and all that. He had no desire for any further religious experience. He had no desire to return to Pocasset. Now, I should say at this point, despite the Times gloomy picture early on of Cape Cod generally and Pocasset specifically, uh, Pocasset, by this point, 1880s, was becoming an attractive summer destination. And some of those summer merrymakers and tourists had torn Freeman's house apart for souvenirs, including the shingles off the roof. Which, you know, compared to what happened with Dillinger, is not all that bad. When Dillinger was, sh when Dillinger, John Dillinger was shot in the alley outside the Biograph movie theater in Chicago, people went up and dipped their handkerchiefs in his blood. That's a whole nother talk. We'll get there. Anyway, we're back at the sanity hearing. Uh, Freeman said all he wanted to do was return to his family, Hattie and Bessie, and accept the first respectable job offered to him. The single justice, Supreme Judicial Court Justice, concluded that Freeman was no longer insane. Freeman was then arraigned, pleaded not guilty. Uh, the lawyers had sort of, kind of, in a way, agreed that he should be afforded bail. Court said, no, we're not doing that. He's going to be remanded into custody. He's staying at Danvers. And the trial was set for December 5th, 1883. Now, uh, presiding at that trial were two Supreme Judicial Court justices prosecuting the Attorney General for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, who generally prosecuted murder cases back then, and a gentleman who was the district attorney for this area, based in New Bedford, named Hosea Knowlton, also prosecuted a woman from Fall River a few years later named Lizzie Borden. So, quite a career. Uh, Freeman had two lawyers. Uh, the only jury issue for this trial was going to be whether Freeman was criminally responsible when he murdered Edie. A few Adventists uh, testified at the trial, including Freeman's friends, Alden Davis, his wife Maddie. Uh, Maddie, by the way, after seeing Edie's body in the Freeman house, nevertheless stayed there all night with the Freemans. About a half dozen uh, physicians testified, all to the effect that Freeman was not criminally responsible when he murdered Edie. The justice said he had never sat on a criminal case when there, in, in which there was no conflict in the testimony. And he advised the jury, and I always point this out, 12 white guys, obviously. Uh, anybody know or remember from my future talks, this comes up every single time, when the first woman sat on a jury in liberal Massachusetts? 1950s? 1951. Not in any of your lifetimes, but in mine. <laughs> so the uh, judge told the jury, uh, I'm advising, you can do what you, do what you feel you must, but I'm advising you that what you should do is return a verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity. Uh, they did. It came back in 10 minutes. Uh, justice, whose name was Morton, sentenced Freeman to Danvers for the remainder of his natural life unless pardoned by the governor and council. And by council, uh, he meant the governor's council. Uh, the trial had lasted just one day, just like Jane Toppins would. And it had a foregone conclusion, just like Jane Toppins would. Uh, Freeman, for his part, said he was glad to go away from the Barnstable jail, quote, to a place more congenial to his feelings. Uh, so on December 6th, he returned to Danvers, where he stayed a little more than three years, 
until finally, on March 17, 1887, the governor and governor's legal counsel, or, or governor's counsel rather, not legal counsel, that's, a, that's a one person. This is governor's counsel, which is a body, released him from Danvers. He was free. The Freemans moved to Chicago. Uh, Charles Freeman ran a restaurant there for a while. Uh, and then the couple moved to Michigan. Hattie died in 1926. And Freeman died two years later, 1928, at the age of 82 in Michigan. Uh, they are buried together in Forest Park, Illinois. Freeman's successor, Alden Davis, prospered in Catawment. He was determined to make it a summer destination. Uh, he ran a hotel that had uh, capacity for some 75 guests. He had guest cottages. He was the postmaster, the train station master, and he was a stone cutter. Uh, he had at one point said that he was going to be creating a white marble grave marker for Edie. Nobody's ever seen it. Don't know where that is. Alden Davis died at the age of 64 in August 1901, within weeks of the death of his wife Maddie, the woman who had spent the night in the Freeman's home after the murder, and also his daughter Annie. Ten days after Alden died, one of the most prolific female serial killers in American history, Jolly Jane Toppin, claimed as her last victim, the la or, or as her victim, not her last victim, there was one more, claimed as her victim, the last member of the Davis family, her best friend, Minnie Davis. Now Minnie Gibbs, whose case was the one for which Jane Toppin was tried, and who as a teenager, back in 1879, had told her constable boyfriend what Charles Freeman had done the previous night. The end. Thank <laughs> you.